Hi, everyone who came to my core conversation on community stuff. So, what are we here to talk about today? Um, is there extra water in the yes, there is caffeine. We're very casual in the core conversation area. Um, so, I wanted to talk today about um, stuff that goes on in the community related to the size of the community and the growth that we've been undergoing, um, the mentoring system processes, all of that related. Um, I think that's something that we really should um, analyze much more than we currently do because fundamentally Drupal has grown so much and will continue hopefully to keep growing. Um, but there's some signs I think um, of some unhealthy things that might be going on. Um, and we should really take a look at that on a regular basis year by year and see if there's ways that we can improve and you know things that we care about should we care about them as much as we do should we be caring about other things you know are these some of these things good or are they bad or whatever um, so a little bit about me i'm david hernandez i work for ffw i'm the manager of learning and contributions there um, so my role specifically is um, all about internal learning education training mentoring um, I'm also community liaison, I deal with contributions, everything. So this is all very relevant to me and something that I'm actually um, looking at more and more as time goes on because it's directly related to my role at the company. Um, again, I work for FFW, which is the world's largest Drupal agency. <laughs> Go team. Um, and again, this is a core conversation, so I should not be the only one talking. I want to hear from everyone. Um, I'm going to go over a lot of different things, but this content is not only about my presentation. You all have to participate. Um, so anything that you want to complain about, go for it. If you have ideas, if you want to interrupt me while I'm in the middle of slides, go for it. Use the mic, shout it out. Um, all of those are fine. Um, I definitely need you to participate because I don't have enough slides to go for an hour. <laughs> so audience participation is mandatory. All right, so 3,000 strong. This is the number that obviously I put in my description and something that I wanted to talk about because it, it gets um, communicated a lot um, as part of the marketing for Drupal of, hey, Drupal 8, as we've gone through development, we've had over 3,000 contributors. We even made a really big deal about this when we got to that number. I remember exactly when it happened during GovCon last year. And it was like, who's gonna be the 3,000th person? And it was a really big deal. And we even gone past that. So I think by release, that number was up to like 3,300, and it's like 3,500 now. Um, and that's gigantic. Uh, Drupal is one of the largest open source communities if you go by people who participate, people who contribute. Um, and if you actually just go by that number, it may in fact be the largest one, um, just by number of people who are actively contributing. So <clears throat> we're allowed to interrupt, right? Yes. So we have to be careful when we say we had 3,000 contributors. We had 3,000 people with commit credit. Yes. We had a lot more contributors than that. <clears throat> yes, officially credited to an issue that got committed to Drupal 8 as opposed to someone who might have just, uh, say, edited documentation on Drupal.org or ran, you heard me, <laughs> uh, or ran an event, or spoke at DrupalCon like I'm doing now, or, made a UX or just speaks at DrupalCon, <laughs> just gives a keynote. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about that number a little bit and how we got here. So there's an, uh, a lot of things that we actively do, which is really great, and things that we're doing now and throughout the entire development process for Drupal 8 that we haven't done before. One of them is having this actual official mentoring team um, and mentoring initiatives. Um, so if you're not familiar, we have these weekly office hours on IRC where people come by, you can get mentored. A lot of this happens at events, so this Friday, um, there is mentored sprints that are going on and we always get lots of people that show up. I think technically we might even get a couple hundred people that show up who are first time contributors at every DrupalCon. Um, um, I know that at every camp that I'm at, I help mentor and at the sprint rooms we're always seeking out new people to get them to participate and it's a really big deal. You get your first con 
contrib credit, your commit credit, and we do a lot of that, which we're doing more than I think we've ever done before. Um, I think there is some cultural change, so a lot of people who, um, even the same individuals who've been contributing in the past, who you can tell, I think, in the issue queues that they've been much more welcoming to new contributors than they were like five, six years ago, because people are really understanding the idea that, hey, these are new people who are coming into the community. They want to actively help. It's a good idea if you like be nice to them and right, like not yell at them and act like a complete jerk to them and like, oh yeah, then they come back and they actually help. Yes, and there are plenty of open source communities who are really bad at it um, that I've even participated in and actually had to get new arguments of people of like, why are you being a jerk to that person? And like they argue like, it's effective being a jerk. Like, no, it's not. Like this is how we weed out people who can't hack it. Okay, good for you. Um, and greater communication, so yeah, we definitely promote a lot more. Um, so I stole some charts. I mean, well, I made one chart and I stole a chart. Um, if you've never seen this before, this is the famous Drupal long tail that we, you know, people have heard of. Um, if you've never heard of before, a long tail is this graph where you can see, obviously, this is um, a, a ranking of contributors and the number of commit credits they have. So you can see it's significantly the tail extends out for people who only have like one or two actual commit credits. And most of the work is actually just being done by a small number of people. I forgot to take zero out of my graph. <laughs> so I made this one. So I must have just completely copied everything that you did. I'm not saying that, but you'll see in another slide that I completely stole that one. I credited XJM, so I was too lazy to redo it for Drupal 8. And you'll notice that, hey, whoa, look at that. It's like the exact same thing. No matter, you know, we did that in Drupal 7, and in Drupal 8, we still have this long tail where we have so many people who are just mostly doing one or two things. It's even longer. It's even longer, yeah. And there's less of a head Yes, we have a smaller, no, I don't think we really have a smaller head. It's just probably, underneath the beginning of the curve. Well, they're not both to scale either. They are, they, they, they are not, so the numbers aren't the, the same in either, ax, the numbers are longer on both axes, but at the same time also, the area of like regular repeat, the work done by repeat consistent contributors is a smaller part of the whole compared to the long tail on the spike by the top group. So it, the, the distribution became starker, that's what I'm saying. Wait, so there's yeah, but some of that is also, I think, because there were so many more commits on eight. I think that might be part of what's demonstrating that. Um, but I have some other numbers to talk about. So I just wanted to show you two, two things just to um, demonstrate the fact that it hasn't really changed that much. Um, but I did look at the numbers for both Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, and there were some interesting things. Not just the numbers, but if you actually look through that list of people, there's some really interesting things that you can take from it. Um, one thing, of, so here are the numbers. So over 3,000, over 3,300 now for Drupal 8, and it was exactly 954 people for Drupal 7. And one interesting thing I noticed that both of those lines start to flatten out around the 200th person. Um, and so I started looking at all the individual people because one of the things we always discuss is uh, burnout and turnover of the people who are contributing. So I wanted to see what that was actually like and I started looking through the list of say the top 10, 20, 30, 50, things like that. And I thought it was actually kind of interesting that it didn't seem like the turnover was as big as people think it is. So for example, of the top 25 people, 10 of them for Drupal 8 are still in the top 25 from Drupal 7, and of the remaining 15, eight are still in the top 100, and 12 are still in the top 200. So that means that there are three people who were not in the top 25. There were three people who were in the top 25 for Drupal 7 who were not in the top 200 for Drupal 8. And I think all three of them are still like in the top like 400 or something. Yeah. Some of those people from Drupal 7 may have been 
initially been involved with Drupal 8, like for a year, and then stopped. So there's a time function. I to a degree, yes, there certainly is that, but I would, I would encourage anybody who's really interested to actually go look at those lists. And if you scan the top 100, it's still extremely familiar groups. So an example clarification, I think what Kathy is getting at is that Sun, for example, was extremely active in Drupal 7, extremely active in the first half, of, like the first two years of Drupal 8 development. Fell off the face of the earth as far as Drupal's concerned. Like he, he basically mm -hmm. left Drupal. He continues to get issue credits to this date yeah. in, in 8.1, 8.2, et cetera, because he commented on issues five, six years ago. So there's, there's an extent to which like, the contributors aren't actually the people who are actively working on issues during that release cycle. It's, it's like the, because of the way we credit issues and because of the length of time it resolves problems. Um, there was a period of time where I wasn't contributing to core patches at all and I continued to get more and more issue credits and that happens to a lot of people. So there's, there's to some extent that those numbers. Sure, I mean we're going to have variation when a project takes five years to complete and that's a problem in itself. If you want to accurately understand who is doing what over what time frame, let's not take five years to have a release. Um, but the, the bigger problem that I think in even discussing that 3,000 number is the fact that, yes, 70% of the people on Drupal 8 had only one or two commit credits, um, which is actually a greater number than even for Drupal 7. Um, so uh, let's discuss some challenges that I think exist, um, problems that currently exist. Um, I know that it's, it's been discussed a lot with people about Drupal Network itself and the patch process and the tool set that's there, um, that it's a major barrier for people to contribute. Um, although I think to some extent it's not as significant as some people think as far as getting people to contribute very actively. Um, I don't think that's actually the number one barrier. I think it's a significant barrier to get people who are less technical involved. Um, so if you want people working on documentation and UX changes and simple like CSS changes, that's yeah, it's a major barrier for somebody who's not a serious developer. Um, I don't think that's necessarily the barrier for somebody who's already a high level contributor continuing to be a high level contributor when they, most of their time is not spent dealing with the issue queue and patches and things like that. It's, you know, the, the thing that's stopping you from making that 500 kill by patch was not the fact that you had to make a patch and upload it. It was, like, it was the fact that you had to write the code to do it. Right? And the same thing, issue queue workflow. I'm really sta stating here more of a project management related issue of like how, how we deal with the issue queues themselves, statuses, things like that. That's something that's completely outside the tool set. I've talked to a lot of new contributors who still have confusions about that and don't understand not necessarily just what the statuses might say, say in documentation, like you set it to this, but I talk to people all the time and say, I don't understand why a person set it to that. And you know, what it is that they're actually saying to me, like is it getting sent back to me? Like they think just says, uploading a patch and then someone reviews it and sends it back to need work, they're like, oh, are they saying they're not gonna accept the patch? I'm like, no, they're just sending it back to you that you might have to do something or there might need to be a discussion or something. Um, I think we need to have a like, we need to talk about this status. I think that might be helpful because it's not just needs work or needs review. It's like this needs more planning or justification. You know, we have some, some statuses for that, but um, there's definitely, it seems like people who are not culturally in the contribution community themselves who are new get confused around a lot of that sort of process and workflow, things that are just understood by other people. I was having conversations with people about that directly yesterday that were just like, we're off issues and they were just like, well, because they set it back to these work or they did something else to it. I'm like, well, so? Like, to, yeah, go talk to them, have a conversation. We're like, oh, I can't do that. Um, then governance. We have some new governance policies around uh, contributing uh, directly to Cora specifically about being able to escalate um, conflicts between people and their ideas and like up to component maintainers and the core commit team stuff like that. I don't know how well it's actually actively being used. I wish there was a better mechanism for doing it other than setting tags. 
Um, you like, how do we actually get someone's attention, and especially for new contributors? Like, if someone's posting something and someone rejects it, like, how does this new person know what the process is to get someone's attention, to get a second opinion, essentially? Like, there's nothing, so those issues just die and they don't come back to it. Um, so that's a bit of a problem. And that ties into conflict resolution. How are people dealing with these, basically all volunteers, and many of them have no idea who the other people are. Right? If you're a completely new person and someone shows up and rejects something that you're doing or says it's not a good idea, you don't even you know, know who these experienced contributors are. Um, and then we have a human component, which I think is actually one of the most important pieces to this. Um, yeah, for a lot of people, there are language barriers, right? So how do they contribute when maybe English isn't their first language? Um, and there's cultural barriers, so even people who speak English, we, you, know, you might have to deal with issues where they're from another country and there's just all kinds of different cultures. People come from different places. They're used to working with people in different ways and you, know, you're, you have an entire amalgamation of all these different people from coming from different places that are volunteering, giving their time, trying to work with each other, doing it online, doing it in IRC, doing it in issue queues, doing it all over the place and it's, you know, it's not always an easy process. And of course time management, which you know, how, do you, how can you devote time? Most of this is volunteering. so it's very difficult for people to get enough time to actually do their contributions. Um, and I think that's part of what leads to burnout and some of these other problems that we have where people you know, are being asked to devote so much of themselves outside their normal work hours if they're not being paid to do it. And you know, that becomes really difficult over an extended period of time. Um, and that leads to burnout and a lot of these other problems. Um, and then growing pains. I talk to people about this. I think that's something that Drupal definitely experiences that we don't talk about enough. Uh, especially with things like tools and processes. Or Drupal started out as being a very small community. You know, you, you might have 10 people in a room who are all working on something and it becomes very profound and it got contributed to Drupal and this was back when it was like Drupal 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. But then you reach a point where you're not dealing with 10 people in a room anymore. You start dealing with dozens of people and then hundreds of people and thousands of people. And right now we have thousands of contributors. The processes and the way things were done and even the culture around how things were done when there were 10 people in a room don't work. And I see people try to force those same standards and those same processes on this much larger group and it just doesn't work that way. Um, and you know, some people might say things like, oh, well, you know, the way it used to be and I just missed that the way it used to be. And it's like, well, when you're at a point where you've got 5,000 people trying to work on a project, it's not gonna be the way it was. You have to change, you have to adapt to that size. Um, and our tools have to adapt to that size, our processes have to adapt to that size. And of course, that all increases expectations. Like, yeah, we have, we're much bigger projects. We're dealing with corporate interests now. We have bigger agencies. You have eight, entire Drupal agencies who, like, their entire livelihood is devoted and dependent on this project and its success and giant corporations that are part of it. And that just raises the expectations for everyone involved. And that increases the pressure on everyone who's trying to contribute and trying to be part of this. So what can we do? What are some proposals? I'd like to hear some ideas from people. I have some ideas of what I think is really important and what needs to be done, um, where my focus is, but I'm really interested in what everybody else has to say. Um, personally, I think we need to focus on the human component, not on just the tools and things like the numbers and the growth. Um, I think uh, that our biggest problem, especially when it comes to burnouts and some of these other issues like getting a release done, is that we don't have enough people that are at that higher level of understanding and technical skill. Um, you know, we had so much difficulty after beta getting released just because we're burning through criticals, but certain criticals, there were only like so many people in the world who literally knew how to do that thing. So everyone else is like sitting around like, hey, I love contributing to Drupal, it's great, it's awesome. They're like, oh, we can't get a release until this critical gets done. I'm like, well, there's only two people who know how to do that thing, so we're all just gonna sit around and wait till they do it and find the time to do it, because that's just the way it is. I think if we can take that middle group of people who we know are already committed and interested and self-motivated to contribute and can help mentor them to be that upper echelon of skill level, and expand that top group so it's not these five people who know how to handle those criticals, we have 50 people who can do it instead. I think we're much better off doing that than focusing on trying to get another thousand people involved when those thousand people are only gonna commit one, one issue and then you're never gonna hear from them or see from them again. Um, 
And I, th I think a good way to do this is with the local events, smaller events. Uh, it's been my experience that the small sprints and small events are actually much more productive per person, I think, than the large ones and often require less effort to actually hold them. Um, so little sprints where we've had like five, 10, 15 people are always just really concentrated and really productive and they're much better learning experiences than showing up at an event with like 500 people and half those people are trying to mentor, half those people don't get anything done, everybody's just talking with their friends and then by the end of the day you might actually get more work done but per person you don't actually get more work done. So if we can put more effort into that, maybe more sponsorship for those local events, uh, more support around them and mentorship for them. I think that would be great. And just more things in general that are local. I'm really big on uh, local events and local resources. I think that solves some of the human element when it comes to uh, language barriers and communication problems. Uh, I think it's, you're much better off having mentors that are regional for those people. They're much better at mentoring them than having random strangers that you don't know and you've never heard of who are in another time zone, in another part of the world, who are just trying to tell you what to do. And there's so much effort, there's so much overhead and inefficiency that goes into just trying to manage those relationships. I think if people can concentrate on keeping that local, um, I think it's much more efficient and much more beneficial to those people. You're gonna say something? I'm waiting until you're ready and then I'm gonna say thanks. You're just gonna say thanks? No, things. Oh, oh, she has notes. <laughs> I have, um, so I'm, li I'm listening. And to, so my, my challenging question that I have is looking at that number, that long tail, and looking at the efforts we put into like mentoring resources and these events and stuff like that. Um, it, if we really look at it and ask ourselves honest questions, is some of it actually worth the effort for, the, for those people and for the mentoring programs? And I'm not suggesting stopping. I'm just suggesting maybe there's different ways to do it. Um, I'm a proponent of doing one-on-one -on -one mentoring. I think that would be much more beneficial for actually growing that middle group of people if we can develop a one-on-one -on -one mentoring program that's more long-term and has greater commitment from the mentors. Um, and my suggestion is maybe we don't stop things like the Giant Friday Sprints, but maybe we also don't try to kill ourselves doing it. Um, so I, I, I'd like to do a couple of things. I'd like to um, provide some context, both historical and current. Um, I, I'd like to propose rhetorical possible partial counterpoints to your right, How about we go one by one? And No, but I, these, these things are all related. And also, um, like, uh, talk a little bit about the things that we're already doing now that maybe that we're doing on a smaller scale now that maybe aren't reflected in, the, in, in your experience as a mentor to this point. Or actually, to some extent, are reflected in your experience because you were part of sprints like the New Jersey Sprint and so forth over the Drupal development cycle. Uh, is, is that okay? So like this yeah. fra framing background information here. Uh, did, I, did I introduce myself this time? I didn't. Nope. I'm XJM. Um, I'm a Drupal 8 release manager now. Um, and so I kind of accidentally started the core mentoring program, sort of. Um, the, it, what Kathy and I were chatting about at the beginning of the session is like you stated that core mentoring was an official thing and we're like, is it an official thing? What's official? How did official come from? It's so in the maintainers. The, the, the aspects about it are, that are official is we did put it in maintainers.txt a year or two ago and we do now have Drupal Association support for the mentoring sprints that we run on Friday. So those two aspects of it I guess you kind of could call official. Um, but, so when, when we originally started the program, the intent wasn't, we're gonna get 500, 600, 700 people committed, contributing to core on this Friday sprint. It was, let's have a sprint that people can join. And the demand turned out to be much higher than we anticipated. So every subsequent event, it like the first time we were like, oh, maybe we'll get like, you know, 40 people at this. And then we had, you know, an entire room full and then the next event, it was like, whoa, we need to plan for that entire room full, and it was more. So it, it wasn't so much that the intent was to have one person mentoring five to 10 people, mm -hmm. it was that the demand for mentoring at the events outpaced what, what we at, were able to deliver, and so we had to change what we were doing in order to scale it. So I wouldn't necessarily say that that's like a design thing of the, of the core mentoring initiative. No, I, I wouldn't say it is. Yeah. I certainly understand that the demand is there, but you yeah. also have to look at the results that you get from that. So and, even and so if the question is, the question is, is 
like there's two separate goals. Is our goal to help other pe help people contribute to Drupal, or is our goal to get stuff done? And it's less efficient for getting stuff done. Is it a better or worse experience for the individual contributors? Is it a do we like is the is the experience that we give people in the mentoring sprints on Friday um, like sufficiently good enough to make for the lack of quality on like a tenth of the people, right? So if we, we could help we could help one tenth of the people really, really well and they would have a great experience and love contributing to Drupal. With the big Friday sprints we have this hit or miss thing, but we provide that opportunity to a lot more people. So it's not even about getting the work done in Drupal. No, it's not about getting the work done, even specifically on that day, but to that point, if 70% of the people involved did only do one or two things, are you even getting that result? Are you introducing anybody to the experience and it's up to any real benefit to them because if they don't come back, is that a success story or not? So, so what, um, one of the things that was always like part of what we um, just accepted because Drupal is a is an open source project, the duocracy, it's an opt-in, you choose to do thing in in at least for the initial experience for a lot of people. Um, the philosophy of it is like this this one hundred ten one rule where you um, you m give an opportunity to a hundred people to become exposed to something, become engaged with it, um, and they try it out. And then of those a hundred people, maybe only actually ten come back and and you know, participate a second time, maybe a third time. But then out of those 100 people, there's one person who it turns out is going to be super, super amazing. That, that one time in office hours that Kathy Thays showed up and holy crap, right? Like it turns out to be something, or, or Scott Kotzer. Um, like years later, this, this little accidental opportunity that you provided someone turns into something where, where it's, not, it's not something you do for like, it, it's something that you do for everyone on the chance that that one person is going to benefit from it and then that, that in turn like is what provides the future of the project. So that's like, that's the question I want to ask is like, is it, is it a bad, is it a bad thing or not is it a bad thing but is it, is it, is it not not working? Oh, you're there, hi. Okay. <laughs> I guess it's Scott <laughs> out there elsewhere in the world. Do you have enough examples of people for whom that has happened? Well, and see, that's the question because it's so it's so subjective, right? Like, mm -hmm. like when you when you look at the long tail graph, I, I was I was a little bit confused by your data there because it's like of the top, a significant number of the top contributors to Drupal eight, I thought were people who were completely new to the Drupal eight cycle. Like, a lot of the top top people were not heavily involved in Drupal seven core, and so I like I, I I'm confused by the data, or at least in my impression of it was that. There, there are a lot of new people. My, my point in that was really looking at how many of the people who were involved in Drupal 7 were dropping off, not just how many people were new. There obviously, I mean, when you're more than three times as many contributors as you had before, obviously there are a lot of new people. But no, I'm saying of, of like the top people, right? Like, is it actually a concern that people who were involved in Drupal 7 aren't involved in Drupal 8 anymore? I don't think it necessarily is. Like I, I don't either. That's, okay. that's why I think we always have these discussions so. about people who drop off and uh, burnout and things like that, and I don't think it's necessary. Burnout is a problem. We don't want burnout because that's an abuse of your volunteers. I don't think people leaving is a problem because you're talking about five years later, six years later. If somebody wants to do something else, they, somebody wants to do something else tomorrow, it shouldn't be seen as a negative. Right. I mean, that's if you even if you have massive amounts of your community who are disappearing, you know, for specific reasons, you know, how they're being treated, or you know, it's an indication of something really bad that's going on. But I talk to people who say the number one problem in the Drupal community is people disappearing. I don't think it's I the number one problem at all. Yeah. So the, I, I wanted to, the, the other, so the, the parts two and three there, I, I wanted to talk about the, the things that are currently changing and then I also have, just as a teaser, we're doing a core conversation on Thursday with Dries that has the other part of the survey results, part of which are mm -hmm. barriers to, to contribution and I have some data here that's I'm not supposed to share yet, but I'm going to talk about it anyway at least potentially if you guys are interested. These are all, like a number of them are things that were up as bullet points on your mm -hmm. slides as to reason like what are the things that are contributions like. Maybe I'll come back to that when we talk about it more since I've been talking a whole bunch here. Um, but the, So there's two things that are going on right now currently that I think 
address some parts of the, the, the problems that you raised, and I just want to make sure that everyone's aware of them. One is that um, with, the, with the changes to the release cycle, this, this extremely, you know, ha having six month minor releases, we're never going to have a year long beta again, where there's complicated things you can't understand, there's everything is blocked on a handful of issues that most people don't know how to solve, and you, that it, it's like, why should I participate? Because I, like that, we, we've changed the release process so that does not ever happen anymore. Because when we, like, in, instead of, um, we, we open the development branch for the next release as soon as the current release goes into beta. So there's no actual freeze, your just work just goes to the next branch. You can continue progressing. You get, still get feedback on your issues. You still get to commit as soon as your patch is ready. You still get reviewers. There's just as much value in working on it, um, regardless of whether or not you happen to be in that beta phase. So that's something that hopefully is, is it's something that was a consequence of the Drupal 8 cycle that is hopefully never going to happen again. Um, because it, it was in awful, it was awful for contributors, it was very difficult for the project and so forth. So I'm hoping that that, that kind of thing is a mostly solved problem already. Um, we will have new problems in its place. And then the other thing that we've started doing just recently is, um, so uh, we've started in, in terms of like assessing you know, what, in terms of like making sure that issues have like the next step in place that actually is what's relevant to the, the component maintainers for that issue or the people who know the right thing. Actually, core mentoring started out, it was supposed to be at the beginning just issue triage. That was all, that was all it initially was and it turned out there were, there were a lot more needs pe people had from it than just like, oh, get these issues updated. But what we've started doing now is we're doing uh, regular major triage with the subsystem maintainers for just the major issues in each of the different components. So at least the, the things that someone has filed is, I think this is a really major bug and it's broken and it's screwing up my site, um, get, a, get a response. So how often are you doing that triage? Uh, uh, I have, yeah. we, are, have been do, we have had a tri triage session almost every two weeks since the beginning of the year. Now the scope is obviously enormous because there are 1,200 major issues. Um, so what we're doing, the, the other side of that, uh, advertisement is on Friday we're going to try to do um, as part of the new contributor sprint have an area that is specifically about the first part of major triage which is verifying whether or not an issue still exists which is a great learning opportunity for someone as a new contributor because instead of having to understand all of these complicated release policies all they need to do is, is learn um, basic get skills about okay um, can I follow the steps to reproduce this issue if I can prove that it still exists at a point in the past um, and it doesn't exist now, why did that happen? And so they, they, it's, it's about learning to navigate the issue queue and at the same time filtering out some of the noise in the major issue queue so that the issues that are relevant to people are more easy to find. So those are like two things that are going on right now that I think are kind of aligned with, with fixing the, the experience for like the, the, the huge, both for issues and for contributors, the huge wasteland of, of there being too many things. And I can talk about the survey results, but someone else should ask the question first. Wait, I have a question. Yeah. This is Chris. So, um, this, is, this is Chris, you're selecting, and you're helping with the major triage. You're helping with the major triage. All that. <laughs> totally there. So, um, I mean, I, I, I think that it, the goal of, of the mentoring program has to be completely to support Drupal. You know, it, it, it's. In my view, it's, it's nice that people have a good time at these things and maybe enhances their visit to, to DrupalCon. I mean, the live, sp the live sprints, but if they're, not, if they're not serving the purpose of forwarding the project, then it has the purpose. I think they do, so. Um, and if, and, and along the same lines, if, yeah, we, we mentioned the 110-1 concept. If, if the only goal of the mentoring program is to find unicorns, there might be a more effective way of doing that. <laughs> You know, there might be, because all of us spend a lot of time on this, and maybe there's, you know, there's easier ways of finding those people. And if we don't look at that sort of scientifically, mm -hmm. then this is like a cargo cult of mentoring. It's a cargo cult? Cargo cult of mentoring. Cargo, cargo cult of mentoring. Google it. <laughs> cargo cult. As in... Yeah, it's where you just keep going through motions, hoping that they have the effect that. But what, what I did. said was, I don't think that's the goal of the mentoring program. 
It might not be. So yeah, and, and that's and th and that's I'm just sort of echoing yeah, the second part of what Jess said was that no, I mean it, it, in the event that we have a, one of these big sprints and people can be immediately useful towards the project, well that helps, right? You know, if we can get a handful of people to go through a bunch of these issues and triage them, they just did a bunch of really positive work. You know, for example, it's not that hard, and you know, um, but I think that whatever we do, we have to at least somehow validate whether these things are really working for Drupal or yeah. not. And if they're not, why are we doing them? That's all. Yeah. But, but they probably are. <laughs> and you know that because so, yeah, right. so, scientific method. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's a couple of things. And one is I, I think we have, when we look at the resources that are devoted to the mentoring program, the DA puts in some money to make Fridays at cons happen, but they don't put resources into other parts of the mentoring program. So they're done because people uh, get their mentoring sponsored through their work, or they're done because they do it as a volunteer, and they come from other places. And so I don't think we have a responsibility to evaluate whether or not the mentoring program benefits the project. I think it doesn't matter whether or not it benefits the project, as long as it benefits the people involved. Um, so I have to disagree on the purpose, but agree with the uh, possibility that it does both, so it may not matter that we argue about whether or not we're right about the purpose. I think I think well, I, when you mentioned just to that point, I just want to say one thing though is that when I, when I think about it, what always concerns me and why I brought this up is I think we do have an obligation though to make sure that if those people are devoting their resources, their time, their energy, that um, we are certain that they're not being abused in any way, and yes. that if they are giving too much of themselves, which people will tend to do very easily we need to be certain that there's even a purpose to what they're doing. Right, but I agree with that. So we need to make sure people aren't injuring themselves or other people, but I, and that there should be a purpose behind it. But I think it would be okay if the purpose was, it doesn't hurt the project, but it really helps enrich other people's lives because I think contributing one time does in fact carry a long lasting effect on people into their work environments and, and other things that they do that may not affect the project. Um, so I agree, we, sh we shouldn't invest a lot of resources in something that's hurting people. I uh, want to caution uh, referring to contributors as volunteering all the time um, yeah. uh, because I, I think we need to look at the percentage of the different areas of the tail, uh, the top contributors, um, the ones who have a lot of commit credits or the ones that have just one commit credit and look at whether or not they were paid for their contribution. Because I, if we think about different theories about how people can get paid, some people get paid to come to the con. And so if they sprint on Friday, they may have actually been paid and they may not have been volunteering. And we get the same thing with um, repeat contributors. I think we need to be careful about not always assuming that they're volunteering their time. Uh, and we are trying to collect data on that, but it's not publicly available in an easy way. And I think the other part of that is that when we look at how Especially for things that are not just commit credit. Right. Um, when we look at why people might contribute once and then not again, I think we need to actually just ask them. Yes. So it would be nice, it would be nice to know what the results of that survey question was. Oh, is that? Is that in that? That's just. I thought you just had the, the Dries survey of, that's asking people about contrib, that was. Did you not take it? I did, I don't remember questions about contributing. It was so long, let's come, let's come back to that. Maybe it's, I'm thinking of a different survey. Hi, I'm Maureen Johnson. I, um, I'm not a contributor, I've never 
tried to do it. And you're here talking, so you're a contributor now. <laughs> I, I guess. So. Um, <laughs> it's like uh, an AA meeting or something. <laughs> um, it is, so I was wondering, because uh, you sound like you were looking for ideas, so this is sort of outside the box. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know, like I'm signed up on Drupal, I don't even know what it is, .org. And uh, I was wondering if there's a survey that you could give somebody that could, that we could fill out to say where we might be a best fit. Um, and, you know, whether it could say, you know, like, maybe not directly like, do you want to do this thing? But like that you could ask a question that you could gauge what we would be useful for. So you kind of know, and that would be like in a pocket for when you need people. It would be maybe something that's associated with our profile, and maybe this already exists, I don't know. And pardon well, Neil, okay. was any and of that in the content re-architecture stuff about like, because I know it's that whole idea of like, you could say you're more of a UX person and get sort of like tailored content to you. Yeah. It's, <laughs> so I was wondering. Website you know, like, personalization. Because yeah. I thought of like when I was in, I don't know, middle school, they would have us fill out a survey and then they would say, oh, you should be a nurse because you showed these qualities. So mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a way for you to make it generic enough to say they would be really good at testing. You know, like I do, I am a contributor in my site, but I know my business process really well. So. I'm very good at giving them feedback because I can kind of see where it doesn't fit into the square peg. So, so is there a way in our profile that we could be poked back to come back and say, hey, you said you were interested and you only contributed once and maybe you'd want us to contribute again. And then my last point would be, um, I don't know if this is possible, but I just registered like last week to come to this event. So of course I paid a late fee, which you should, but I don't know if you can say, well, we'll waive fees if you produce hours or if you do that in advance. Because sometimes money motivates people who aren't making money from selling software from their business or getting people to come to their company as a government employee. But I don't know if it could be something where your hours could be, you know, come back. So I just suggest that as an idea. If you can. You mean earn. actually paying people? No, no, reducing fees based on other, other the hours that, that you have done. Yeah, that. Some people can't accept. Right. Like boxes, you can right, so if you've been doing yeah. core contribution this year, you can get a free ticket to Drupal yeah, with a cap, or something. You know, obviously, you have your expenses you have to cover, but I don't know if that might be. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So I'd like to answer like the, the, your first question because it's much safer. Um, <laughs> it, it, one of so there is something like this that's kind of a, a do-it-yourself version that sort of already exists. We have the section of the Drupal.org handbook called the Contributor Tasks Handbook, and so what it what it has is it has sections like based on skills you may have, like like um, I I speak English well, or I speak a second language, or or I I can do documentation, or like skill sets like that, not not topical areas, but like basic skills you have, and then underneath that, it has a. Can you can you put could you put it up on your screen? The contributor task handbook. Um, I think it's it's like Drupal.org/contributor-tasks. Um, and you can see under there, there's a list of tasks you can do. Each of those tasks has instructions. And then it has a link to an issue queue that might have issues that have those tasks in it. Obviously, it's, it's really hard to, like, the, the problem is finding the actual issue that has that actual task you can do. But at least you can read the instructions of it and say, OK, based on, as, as someone who's a non-English language speaker, for example, if you click on non-English language speaker, you can then see what the tasks are under that group, go to that page, and then it says, like, oh, this is something that I could do to contribute to the project. The, the, and the reason that we do this with, like, a documented task and then a link to a queue is that the, the process of finding tasks for people to work on is actually 
one of the most challenging things for the mentoring program in general has been finding ways, because we, there's, you know, there's 5,000 issues that are open, there's all of these different initiatives and so forth. So if, if you're involved with like, a, if you listen to Teresa's keynote and be like, wow, content deployment, I think I have great ideas about that and I'd love to help with that. You can get involved with that team. But if it's more like, ah, oh, I just kind of, I don't really know where to start. I, I have this skill that I want to provide. It's much, much harder to find tasks that are related to that skill. So instead there's a, a lot of, um, we try to teach people how we find tasks ourselves. But so this is like a starting point. It, it's definitely not nearly as like helpful as a survey. It's very do it yourself, but that, that resource is there and so it's maybe a, a starting point and maybe you, maybe you, if you look at this, you have, you'll have ideas for us for how to make it into, into that kind of an interaction. If there's a way to take this and then do the thing that for you would be like, oh, that would have made it so that I knew what to do there. So the problem is it doesn't it, it does not, it does not do. prompt them. There's an issue for this. Well, I mean, there's a lot of things we would have to give people when they it's sign a lot up. Of, it's a lot of resources to try to do them. But I think one of the things that VA has been doing really good with uh, lately is um, the, the newsletter that goes out. Uh, that reaches a lot of people uh, who just have an account and it kind of pokes people every once in a while, and the quality of information in the newsletter, I find high. Like, I actually will read it to figure out what's <laughs> going on. Um, and so perhaps we can um, put in a, a, like a get involved section into the newsletter, which just occasionally dribbles out, like, look, there's this resource you may not have known about. And so it allows us to poke people using the tools that we have so we don't have to ask the DA to build any new tools. So there's always some advantage in that. So I think when you asked if we have tried poking people, and we haven't, but there might be a way we could do something like a newsletter that's already going out to a lot of people that might provide some of that functionality. Yeah, I, th I think the whole automating all of this. No, Mike? Both of you, Mike? Uh, yeah, I just want to add, I think automating all of it is it's a hard problem. Yeah. Computers aren't good at it. Like, you might show up to Sprint and not know that you really like re-rolling re patches or know what that is. Uh, so, but yeah, there's certainly opportunities uh, we could like shorten some of the paths, but the computers aren't gonna tell us what to do. Is there any, would there be any resistance to pushing that information to new users as opposed to them seeking it out? So like what we discussed before, like someone signing up and filling out a survey and saying these are my skills and then actually have Drupal.org pushing that in. I think we have an, an issue for that as a proposal to, to like as to adapt the new user sign up process on Drupal.org so that it gives them more information about the next steps and then a related outstanding task that hasn't been cared for in the same way for a long time is um, improving the contribute section of the handbook so that it's actually something we can point them at that is gonna be useful to them. Right. So like in... The problem with that would require changes. Can you give us a server report? Okay. <laughs> well, I, I think also part of the problem is being able to better organize the work that we have. Like yes. when someone shows up and says, I'm a UX expert, I can help on that stuff, like give me something to work on. I'm like, we uh, do have an answer for that now, which is that the usability team has started their own website that's, yeah. that scrapes issue data from Drupal.org using Gabor's rocket ship thing. Um, so that like if, if, if your skill is usability, <laughs> we, we've had a very difficult time for the duration of the Drupal 8 cycle connecting uh, usability experts, designers, and project managers, especially with the areas that, that they're good at. To some extent, um, like front-end developers, we were able to connect to issues, and we did a really great job with, with people with documentation skill and back-end developers, and a, a great job with people who are just willing to test anything. Um, and so th there's like, depending on what the skill is, like you'd either have a better or worse experience at these, these sprints that we've been talking about. Okay, so, so I'm gonna talk, like, I'm gonna talk just briefly about some of the survey results that came up in conversation, um, but come, if you're interested in this, come to Dries' core conversation on Thursday afternoon. It's the last one before the closing session, um, and hopefully we'll actually manage to get some of this data segmented and in, into the slides, because 
we haven't done that yet because we're all very busy people and busy doing other things like giving the Dries note, for example. Um, that's Dries and then others of us helping with content in it. Um, so that the, in the survey results, one of the questions that was asked um, was about uh, if, so, so what is your involvement with, with Drupal? Uh, let's see, the exact wording was, Sorry, I've, I, I had it right here in front of me and then I, I, I scrolled away from it for some stupid reason. Um, okay, so what, which of the following best describe how you relate to Drupal is the exact question. Um, there were about 3,000 people who answered the survey and big, big disclaimer that there is extreme participation bias here because people who take the survey are people who are already interested in Drupal and to a disproportionate extent, people who've probably had a good experience with Drupal, and even more disproportionately, people who've been paid to contribute or who are already, like, have a successful, like, volunteer career, if you will, in quotes. Yes. So, but, so in those, in those survey results, of the respondents of 3,000 people, 24% uh, say they contributed to Drupal in a volunteer capacity, and then among those 24%, 6% of the total um, so, and actually 164 people, I think, as of like a week ago, said that they're actually paid to contribute to Drupal. So, which is a, a bigger number than I was expecting. Now, that's not necessarily paid full-time. That can be paid in a part-time capacity through like 20% time. It's not specific on the survey. Um, but we do, we do actually have, you know, some information that a, 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 an increasing percentage of people are contributing as paid contributors. Um, but it's still, it's still also a minority of the groups by a significant fraction, at least from the, the people who cared enough about Drupal to spend 15 minutes filling out this difficult survey. Um, <laughs> and then it, going on, there's also a question on here about, there, there were two questions about um, what, it, what are your biggest frustrations with Drupal itself? And then another one was what are your biggest frustrations with contributing to Drupal? Um, and the one about, the, the, obviously the frustrations with Drupal itself are for some people a stopping point, but what I thought was interesting is of uh, only 24% of people said they contributed to Drupal, but almost all of them answered the question about frustrations with Drupal, or like, like something, something like four-fifths answered the question about what their frustrations are. So this, what we can sort of infer here is that there are a lot of people who tried contributing once and went away because they had a frustration with it. Um, and one, I'd like to look more at like the, the like who answered which things, but what, what we can tell right now is that the top response was 34% of people were frustrated with the complex issue queue process, which supports what you were saying earlier about like, uh, they marked it needs work and I don't know what I'm supposed to do next and the issue doesn't tell me, right? Like, I, I have no idea where to go from here. There's all of these requirements. The requirements around the beta phase are another example, but where there was all of this issue queue process that was a necessary evil, but resulted in it, especially for newer contributors, a bad experience. Um, the second highest result was that uh, bugs and patches don't get reviewed and fixed fast enough. That was 32% of respondents were concerned about the, the rate of feedback and the issues. Um, and then the third highest response was that um, the, the size of the Drupal code base itself was too over overwhelming and too complex to figure, to figure out how to get involved. Um, there are issues on there about uh, language or cultural barriers, which was a very, like, one of the lowest percentages, it was actually the lowest percentage response, but then there's the, the participation bias thing there is, if you've had language or cultural barriers to participating, that's probably also a reason that you, you, the survey wasn't promoted to you, right? It was in English, first of all, and, and so all, all of those language and cultural barriers that kept you from getting involved with Drupal are also barriers for all the things there. But that, that's, so that's the data that we have so far. It's, it's, I think that the safest thing to do is to start with the things that we know are known problems for people who at least tried once to contribute because it's much more difficult to find the people that we haven't been able to reach at all yet and that's like an entirely separate problem. So was the, the whole patch workflow stuff, was that one of the answers or is that roped into issue queue workflow? Uh, complex issue, the, the, the full text is complex issue queue process and slow consensus building was one possible response that had the highest number of respondents and the second was bugs and patches don't get refuted and fixed fast enough. Um, so that, that, um, delib that doesn't, like tools and technology. It, it, it doesn't distinguish between the, the, the tools and the procedure because 
for, for a new contributor, those are actually kind of part of the same thing, right? There's this whole set of unknown things that you have to learn that are, some of them are procedural and some of them are related to the tool itself. But the fact of the matter is that procedure and tool are like two sides of the same thing. Like, our, our tools should explain what the procedure is, that the tool should be what the procedure is. And, and our procedures, on the other hand, need to be surfaced on our tools and not documented off somewhere else remotely. So that's like an, a part of, an internal part of the problem. We did do a separate contribution barrier assessment. Um, this was an exercise with a small group of piece, people recently that I, I can also, um, we, we shared internally, which is we went through and evaluated like 100 different barriers to contribution and said, uh, just is this, for, from people who were dedicated Drupalists, is this, a, first of all, is this a problem that will take, uh, is, is it a horrible problem, is it a slight problem, will it, will it improve the experience a little bit or a lot, and then compared that with, would this take a week to fix, a month to fix, a year to fix, I don't think we can ever fix it, and, and using those two things, we came up with a short list of a couple of both tool and process improvements that we can implement in the short term to try to get the most benefit with the least amount of despair and frustration. Um, so I th the, well, the difference is that they're being implemented right now. Um, so so the, the, the top, the, the thing that we identified as the top priority from process perspective was this usability um, problem that we were talking about. It's too difficult to make uh, usability and design contributions too difficult to improve the user interface in the correct way through the core issue queue. And so the solution that we're testing for that is this um, new usability team with its own separate site and new set of of processes that hopefully are reflect more what designers needs are versus what a back-end developers framework managers needs are. And then the one of the, the sort of like we identified several top priorities in terms of the tools, things that had required changes to Drupal.org itself, and then we actually shared that shortlist with the Drupal Association and said, okay, of these things, we think these things could be doable in a short time. Which of these are hard or easy? And like we were actually wrong about one of them. For, for example, like one of the things that came up as something that is, could be implemented in, in a short time scale that will be really effective is just automatically checking if patches apply or not when their needs review and marking the needs work if they don't apply without a full test run automatically so you don't have to come back after four weeks and find out the patch doesn't apply anymore. And then as a second follow-up step to that is that you can then um, automatically reroll patches so that's no longer a requirement because that's something that, a, you know, two-thirds of the time a computer can't actually do. Um, so there's, so there's issues open for both of those things, and so we are actually, um, and maybe, maybe we just need to communicate, <laughs> communication is all the problem. Communication this might is, be helpful, yes. This very recently within the past month um, that, that we, it was actually before the survey launched that we, that we started doing these two things. So the, that, that's where the, the, like, address the tools part of it and the process part of it in parallel, because fixing those two things has different requirements. Fixing process just requires us to come up with a, better process that still meets the needs that the original process was created for. But fixing the tools requires um, a lot of times di design resources, developer resources, and so right. on. So that, that, that's kind of like, well, let's, let's tackle both of those things at once so that they can All right, can happen. you sum that up before we go any further? We're pretty much. I did. Wasn't that done? OK. Well, you what kept talking. Oh, no, I'm we're still talking. That's what I was saying. OK. All right. I want to hear them. Uh, this is Peter Willen. Uh, just a couple things in terms of feedback more directly to David's thought about one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring. I mean, something I haven't seen happen, I don't know, could happen is collecting contact information from people at especially larger sprints, but maybe also as part of the Drupal.org sign-up process, and you ought to know what part of that is. In particular, uh, collecting, you know, where do you live and are you, you know, can we uh, share your contact information with people organizing events in your area, because I think that making that connection between people who have traveled to attend Drupal or already might not get reconnected with a more local group um, is seems to me like that could be a gap in kind of keeping those people engaged in the longer term. Mm -hmm. um, and then another suggestion, you sort of mentioned funding or money somewhere in there, but I think uh, I haven't ever seen uh, a push, and I don't know come from exactly, but it, it feels like like it would be useful to start having a, a sort of conversation about if your company uses Drupal, like maybe there's a sort of range of percentages of your revenue from Drupal that you should be contributing back um, 
And you know, can we have people that are kind of stepping up and saying, yes, I am contributing this much back to support the association or sprints or you know, fund people who are from poor or like have a range of ways that they could you know contribute back money, but that you know it is free software, but yet, you know we do need you know money really to make these things uh, keep going for such a large community. So, yep. Any thoughts there? Great. Any else? Drum said, yes, we can, but we don't want it to be a multi-page thing. And so we have to decide what's most important. He said, yes, we can, but Josh said no. <laughs> no. You, had a, you had a point, though? You wanted to ask a question, the gentleman? But Jess kept talking, and I was trying to interrupt. Dude, excuse me. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Track chair. Track chair.